aproveitando toda a comunidade que nós temos aqui hoje connosco, no fundo de pessoas e de organizações que todos os dias trabalham para alcançar o sucesso deste sistema, nós gostávamos agora de partilhar convosco e em primeira mão que, após muita investigação em diferentes metodologias, vários programas em contexto prisional, dezenas de visitas a casas, a prisões noutros países, a Reshape vai finalmente ter a oportunidade de criar, em parceria com a Sapaná e com o apoio da Direção-Geral de Reinserção e Serviços Prisionais, uma casa de saída. As novidades uh, não acabam aqui e, por isso, atenção a todas as pessoas do norte do país, porque esta casa vai ser criada em Braga. Tô... <risos> Obrigada. Uh, todo o apoio vai ser uh, bem-vindo neste sentido. Em primeiro lugar, vamos ter de encontrar um local, portanto, vamos de ter de encontrar a nossa casa, uh, vamos ter de mobilar a nossa casa a seguir, vamos ter de encher de profissionais uh, voluntários, fazer a ponte com as empresas, as organizações sociais da região. Uh, e também sabemos que, uh, with great power comes great responsibility, algo, algo que o Spider-Man nos ensinou, e por isso, contamos com todos vós para construir, de facto, uma casa e um modelo de sucesso. E estamos, obviamente, muito satisfeitos por podermos partilhar convosco hoje esta notícia. Vamos concluir a nossa manhã com o primeiro painel do dia, Houses or Prisons, onde vamos conhecer três ângulos distintos. Teremos connosco Johan Luta, Uh, que nos traz a visão completa de quem já viveu dentro e fora dos muros da prisão e que hoje gera uma organização que é o Wayback, uh, uma organização sem fins lucrativos norueguesa que apoia a reintegração de pessoas reclusas na sociedade e que tem um lema muito forte. Your choices, your freedom, your responsibility. You are the skipper of your own life. E, portanto, és o capitão, és a capitã da tua própria vida. Vamos ter também Sabrina Pudo, é uma investigadora Marie Curie, na Faculdade de Arquitetura de Lavon. A Sabrina é coautora de vários livros, escreve regularmente para jornais e revistas, já ensinou em várias escolas e tem atualmente, atualmente em Lavon um design studio, que eu acho que é particularmente interessante e invulgar, e que se chama mais ou menos assim em português. Esta não é uma quinta de uma prisão, so it's not a prison farm, Uh, terrenos devolutos para o estabelecimento de uma comunidade imperfeita. E aqui, juntamente com os alunos de arquitetura, uh, a Sabina está a trabalhar numa proposta de quintas residenciais que vão ser baseadas em princípios de justiça restaurativa e ambiental. A nossa terceira convido, convidada, e uh, eu não vou esconder, eu sou uma, uma acérrima fã, uh, é MJ. A MJ é uma força da natureza, tem uma energia e um talento muito contagiantes, dirige quatro coros comunitários em Londres, é completamente apaixonada pelo canto e uh, pela forma como o canto pode trazer alegria e positivismo à vida das pessoas. Uh, a MJ de vez em quando faz uh, coros uh, pop-up com as pessoas que estão, que estão na rua uh, e por isso eu vou começar a juntar aqui <risos> o meu swing. No caso da MG, querer fazer também aqui connosco um coro na sala, mas enfim, fica só, fica só a mesma ideia. Uh, para, para moderar este painel, que eu acho que é bastante único, uh, vamos ter connosco Helene de Vos. Uh, a Helene investiga o sistema prisional no Instituto de Criminologia de Lovam. A sua pesquisa foca-se na normalização das condições de vida nas prisões belgas e norueguesas. A Helene é uma parceira muito próxima da Reshape, porque é também diretora executiva do movimento Rescaled, ao qual a Reshape pertence, como já vimos, e que defende, entre outros pontos, as casas de detenção em detrimento das prisões de grande escala. Portanto, sejam muito bem-vindos, Johan Luta, Sabrina Pudo, MJ Paranzino e Helene de Vos.
Thank you very much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Duart. I cannot see, but and Richie for having us here. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, so my name is Helene de Vos. I will be moderating this session, and I am the executive director of Rescaled. And Rescaled is the European movement for detention houses. And those houses are the houses from the title of this panel. So we won't be talking so much about prisons, more about um, the houses. Um, now, I do see some familiar faces in the audience. So some of you already know quite well what we're going to discuss. Uh, but for others, this is still new. Uh, so I will start giving a very, very short introduction about detention houses. And then I'll give the floor to the speakers uh, to take this a step further. Um, but first, I would like to ask you to say, to say something about yourself. Um, who, Johan, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Johan Lothe. Today I'm managing Wayback. Wayback uh, is an NGO focused on the transition of inmates from the prison to society. And in order to do that, you need some experience and the competence. And the competence I have is from my own um, in incarceration. I spent uh, several years in Norwegian prisons. And uh, that experience I'm using today in order to meet people both inside prisons, at the gate, and also afterwards, after the, the, their sentence. And, I both know, uh, I also know from my own experience how hard it is to meet society and I also know from the people whom I meet every day because I know only my story and that was how I could solve my problems but I don't know how to solve the rest of uh, the, the inmates' uh, issues. I had serious uh, drug problems and that uh, is adding to the experience I have from being uh, incarcerated. So. That's the education I'm using today. My, the, I have a master's degree of University of Life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sabrina. Yeah, just, I mean, my PhD is nothing to that, <laughs> compared to that. Uh, hi, thanks for inviting me. And I already had an introduction. So my name is Sabrina Pudo. I'm, a, I'm an architect. Uh, I'm a researcher. I'm also an educator because I teach and I see it as a sort of my active practice. Uh, I work at the Faculty of Architecture for K11, and my research looks particularly at prisons in the countryside, both in history and today. There are less now. As an architect, I'm, of course, I'm interested in space and architecture, but always uh, in the relationship between uh, space, architecture, what the institutions want, and what the institution imagine, and how people react to that, and how people inhabit it. Um, I, uh, I, yes, I want to start with a disclaimer because in Reshape social media wrote that I was a poso de con conocimiento. I think that's the right <laughs> way. Uh, I was very flattered, but I don't think so. I mean, as I said to Duarte when he invited me, I, at this point, have more questions than certainties about the old, the old prison system and also probably I have a lot of questions about rescales at this stage. And I have a lot of questions also about what architecture can do because very often this sort of a event we expect a lot from architect. And uh, I, I always uh, feel that architecture cannot solve the problem. There are limits to what we should do and we should limit ourselves. So architecture can have a, a huge power and this has been shown in the design of prisons in the 19th century, and that's one reason why we should limit that sort of power in controlling people, but also in organizing the life of people, in organizing their life, their relationship, etc., etc. I also believe that uh, space and architecture are not so um, dogmatic, they're very ambivalent, in the sense that uh, space that are designed for something that can be used for something else, or they have an ambivalent, uh, component, if you think about the prison cells, if you think about the cell, and we go to the extreme case, the cell has been uh, designed and used as a, as a place of violence and containment in prisons, of course, in detention centers. But in other cases, it has been a place of liberation and emancipation. So probably it's not, 
there are much more ambivalence in architecture that we usually expect from, uh, uh, from architects. Hence, and this is my third, and I conclude about the architecture thing, <laughs> is that maybe we should avoid to attach labels to architecture. So in, in discussion about uh, new prison architecture, there is a lot of discussion about bad colors and good colors, bad materials and good materials, bad sides and good sides, bad elements and good elements. And I think we should put this under discussion, even in an audience that is not formed by architects, basically. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. We're very happy that you ask the critical questions and uh, you keep challenging us, but I'm sure that you also have some answers for us. Uh, MJ. Hello, uh, I'm MJ. I'm co-founder of Liberty Choir with my wife and partner, Ginny, who's in the second row, Ginny Duggery. And um, Liberty Choir is a charity and you heard that I'm a musician, and, and I do believe in the power of music and singing. But let me tell you briefly about Liberty Choir. We go into prisons, and we form a choir with the residents of the prison, men and women. But it's not just about me going in and singing. It's about bringing the community into the prison and singing with the residents of the prison. So 2025 residents and 2025 people from the community all different ages, singing together, all styles of music. I actually call it socialized singing. Choir covers it, but it's socialized singing. It's being together, mingling, talking, socializing, singing all styles of music from classical to pop to rap to musical theater to jazz to swing to reggae. And we're a full circle, full circle charity. So when the men and women come out, we're there for them. Because every week, we're there for two hours, where we get to know each other. We have fellowship and comradeship without religion. And so when they come out, they have an association with us. And for those that want to maintain that fellowship and friendship, we're there for them. For those that want to come to my community choirs on the outside, that's cool, or do other choirs. Some people need us and need help to navigate through the system, and so our volunteers will be there for them. Some people don't. And uh, in brief, that's what Liberty Choir is. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, all three of you. So we're going to talk about houses, uh, detention houses. So houses meant for incarceration, houses meant to replace traditional prisons. Um, and why we're doing that is um, because we believe that the context of a detention house is much better fit for what we expect of uh, incarceration, of what we expect of liberty deprivation. Um, and that is because when um, the prison was designed as a prison institution in the 19th century, it was designed for solitary confinement. Um, but now, 200 years later, we, we know that um, solitary confinement, which was believed to lead to moral improvement, has actually very uh, negative effects on people's mental and physical health. Um, and that's why criminologists, uh, prison researchers, but also human rights um, activists, instruments, are advocating for a shift towards reintegration, rehabilitation, uh, the restoration of harm done, normalization of detention conditions. And that's very different from the initial ideas. Um, but the concept of the prison has not really evolved with those evolving ideas. So the concept of built environment is still more or less the same as that in the 19th century. Um, so how do detention houses differ from um, the large prison institutions, they're built on three principles which have already been mentioned, but I'll mention them again. So detention houses are small scale, they are integrated in a community, and they are differentiated, so they differ from each other um, in, in all kinds of ways. Now, three principles, three speakers. Um, so we will ask each of you, each of the three speakers, to reflect on one of the principles. Um, Sabrina. Yes, the first principle is small scale. Um, so we're thinking of uh, size of a house, not the size of an institution, and we believe that that's more humane, more personal, more individualized. 
Um, what do you, how, what does small scale mean to you as a researcher uh, as a, and as an architect? Well, what I do as a designer uh, with my students, we don't design detention houses, so we ask them to design houses and farms for people that uh, are usually marginalized in society, but not only limited to them. Uh, so it's sort of an effort of imagination that are usually criminalized if they're not only marginalized. So, and that because of that, sometimes they have no housing, so they find it very hard to find housing accommodation. So we design houses. And they are on small scale. So we found ourselves to design these uh, residential farms based on restorative justice principles that are for 13, 16 people, 16 people. And that was the question that we have asked many times, how large or how small should these houses be? What's, what's the number? Is there really an ideal number or not? So a um, few weeks ago, I went to, um, to visit a student cooperative housing, so not a prison not marginalized people, but anyway, people that are struggling, particularly in the UK context, to find house and came together. And I asked them, what's the ideal number of, uh, to live collectively as a group, as a cooperative? What is the ideal number so that people engage enough in the activities of the house, in the decision making, there are self-governing cooperatives? What is the ideal number so that conflict does not escalate and can be discussed? What is the ideal number so that solidarity can emerge in a group of people that, of course, has shared intentions, share ideas, share needs, but it's not, so, not also so homogeneous. There is variegation into it. Um, I got two different answers from two members. So one of them told me, as we are, so we are a, a cooperative of 100 students, clustered, so they are divided in apartments of five, six people. Uh, and this is a good number because this allows us to be open enough. And this allows us to resolve conflict internally. So if there is a problem in one of the apartments, in one of the unit, people can move, can be reshuffled. But engagement, I mean, we need to accept that not everybody will engage at the same level. So another person jumped in and told me, I know what the ideal number is. The ideal number is uh, 25, 30 people, because that's what uh, keeps the engagement high. But he told me, you know, you shouldn't go too small, because if you go lower than eight, then we will have some sort of toxic relationship, too close, we get bored, so don't go smaller than that. And then I've been thinking, you know, I was thinking about deepening this research about uh, cooperative and collective housing outside in free society, and it's, there is a huge discussion in architecture. For the past 10 years, we've tried to understand how can we do that instead of build social housing, for instance, that are built by the state. And so we have a lot of discussion going home. So how many rooms, how big the room should be? It should be too small, small enough so that people go in the living room, or should the room be generous enough, large enough? so that people, they have their own space. What facilities can we share? How is circulation? What's the interface with the city? And we go probably to the integration thing. Um, what's the number of people, of inhabitants? But then, you know, I was starting to look at that. And I got to the conclusion that despite the resonances between co-living and co-housing outside and detention houses, there are some differences that are very depth, are very deep. So, one of these is that in the detention houses, there is probably a lack of freedom that will never be overcome. And the other one is that there is, will always be a sort of top-down institutional power, even in the softest version where, you know, as Ken was saying before, in the new transition houses, there are no prisoners, there are participants, yet institutional power is there. So unless we start to accept that a sort of self-governance is accepted in this group of people, and that's the other question, what's the group of people in a detention house? Is that just composed by the people that are in prison or does it include also the staff? Um, I don't really have an answer. Like smallness seems reasonable, it's like an apple pie, everybody wants it, everybody likes it. Um, and in the 60s, 70s, where the anti-institutional movements, then people also endorsing principles, like normalization principles in the Scandinavian country, came out and starting to fight against the old institutions, they went, for, they went for small houses. So they were saying we should build houses that are maximum 20 people. Again, 20. 10, maximum 20. They were doing so because it was a reaction 
institutions are big things, they're big buildings usually, large, homogeneous, isolated buildings. So it was a sort of reaction. If we look around, uh, am I, do I still have time or? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I look around what's happening, at least in Europe, so my closest, um, the, the closest place. So from what I've, I've gathered from discussion with the prison practitioners, people from Rescale, and by looking at case studies, it seems that 15, 12, 15 is the ideal number, 20 is the maximum you should go. So like a transition house in Denmark called the uh, Skyboo, there are 20, 24, but includes both uh, imprisoned people and non-imprisoned people. The transition houses in Belgium, I think they are around 15, 17. Um, a prison that I'm very familiar uh, with in Italy, who is a prison farm, they had uh, a fault, like a place where shepherds were living by themselves, imprisoned shepherds living by themselves. They were uh, maximum 20 and uh, they told me that's the maximum number you could reach, otherwise things go wrong. So this uh, sort of 20 is coming. But in reality, we also reach 50, 60s. So there are experiences, like the new one, I think that one of the new detention houses that we built in Belgium, in Kurtek, will more or less have 50, 60 people, which is the same number that then you have uh, in open regime prisons, like Rezalad, 50, 60 people which is probably the same number from an experiment from Italy in the 90s. They built more or less 100 new prisons, little prisons. No one knows about that because they never opened them. So they build them and they build like 90. So there is, I can find very little record and I know from some of them. Uh, but then in, you know, in the 2000, they decided they were not worthy. So they decided to go for new real estate ventures of very large prison complexes. And again, I think there were around 50, 60 people housed there. I was reported again by some people that I, I keep asking, I'm like Sarah, I keep asking to people that have been in prison, work with prison, what's the lowest number? So, and even today I got the same answer, don't go too small, because if you go slow, uh, smaller than eight, five people, you know, people get bored and relationship can get too toxic. You're going to stay with the same number of people for a very long time. So intuitively, I think that maybe a good way to understand what a good number is, is the number of people sitting around the table. The, the number of people that manage us to sit around the table as a group, not as a family, not for the intimacy of the family, but to have discussions, to have discussions about who we are as a group, what our conflicts, what our needs. And that sort of table is probably giving the, so the sides. Um, I conclude because I'm uh, uh, with uh, three reflections. Because as I was saying, smallness it, it seems reasonable, um, and there are very little arguments against it apart from uh, economy. So it's an economical issue, of course, to have a lot of small houses. So my three reflections are these: the first one is that uh, smallness in, in prisons are re is reasonable if the prison houses are discrete. They're not units in a large prison system. The second one is that to understand how small you should go as rescale in your proposal, maybe we should try to shift our perspective from the institution to the people inhabiting it. And the third reflection is that a small number of people doesn't mean small space, but space can be generous and probably should be generous, even more generous than comparative houses in free society. And that also this doesn't mean that these houses will look like homes, will look homely. I don't believe so much in being homely by design, and that's a tendency that we see. I think that a place looks homely in the moment in which people appropriate it and inhabit it, and they are given the possibility to do so. So it's a sort of bottom-up proce process, not given by architects like me. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. I, uh, <laughs> I think you've just proven how important it is to ask the right questions and to challenge things. And what I really like uh, about your work is that you also look from different perspectives, as you said, and also look at things without, um, outside of the prison system, like the students' housing, or because as a criminologist, we tend to look at best practices that already exist as a, in, within the prison system, but it's really nice to look at uh, other types of housing as well. So thank you for that. MJ. Um, so this, the second principle that we have at, uh, for detention houses is community integration. Um, 
how we understand this is that a detention house should always be integrated in the local community mm -hmm. and that there that should enable a, a, a dynamic interaction between a detention house and a neighborhood um, so the people the service providers like teachers psychologists social workers from the neighborhood enter the detention house to offer the services there and the other way around the detention house should add value in some way to this neighborhood now you've already mentioned your liberty choir that's all about community that's right can you tell us what this community integration means to you yes so um i'm big on community i think that uh <laughs> Uh, we really can't exist without each other. That's what it's about. And um, so when we do Liberty Choir, first let me just back up, people are going into the room, not just the residents of the prison who are community within that system, but people from the outside. People from the outside as well as people in the prison all have skills. They have issues. Some people are happy, some people are sad, some people have terrific professions. Some people have uh, never been able to find their passion or their dream. They may be bipolar, dyslexic. Uh, they may think they've been lucky and they re don't recognize that they have any issues at all, amazingly. Um, we come in all shapes and sizes, all backgrounds, races, religions, no religion because we're just people from the community. And we can be fearful. What are we fearing? We're fearing the unknown. If we, if we don't know each other, we can't build together. We can't care for each other. We can't lift each other up. And that goes both ways. It's not just the people coming in to Liberty Choir from the community. It's also the residents of the prison. This is what we're about. It's about the uniqueness of the individual and the uniqueness of us when we're all together. And uh, when I first started the program, when Jenny and I started it, they would say, you go in and sing with the men or the women. I said, no, 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 I have to bring people in. So for first, for the prison system or the justice system, if you don't bring people into the system, no one knows. It's a hidden secret, okay? So no one knows. So Liberty Choir is there every week for two hours, no matter what. And even during a lockdown, I bring people in and we'll sing in the wings. And I'll, I'll yell up and I'll say, just so you know, we're here. You can count on us. We're here. Now, granted, most of the volunteers are of a certain age, mostly women. We do get the young professional who get... Uh, off from work and get paid leave from work who come in, okay? But most are of a certain age. But wouldn't it be terrific if everybody could get involved? So, so now in this room where we're singing, and what happens when we sing, we learn, of course we get well-being. It's a fact. Everybody knows about it. We breathe together. We feel good. It's fantastic. But we also get to understand each other. We learn about reading and writing and perceiving patterns and social history and diction. We learn that somebody may be posh. And I'm sitting next to him and I thought I could never have a conversation with that person because they won't understand me. And all of a sudden, we're squeaking and squawking together and making this strange sound. And everybody's voice is important because it's not about auditioning. It's not about being the best. It's about making a sound together, doing Vivaldi's Gloria or Uptown Funk, okay? Or My Way. By the way, the song My Way, it doesn't matter if English, English isn't your first language. Everybody knows My Way. <laughs> What's that about? But the key is, is that when they get out, They've made this friendship, this fellowship with people from the community, and the community knows them. And all of a sudden, fear dwindles away. Understanding develops. And guess what? The people from the community, as well as the people, residents in the prison, all have skills. Some are teachers, some are lawyers. Some can teach somebody on a computer. You can hold somebody's hand, maybe two of you, on each side of a person to help them orchestrate the system. So when you go out and you build the homes, 
people know and they understand. And actually then the community would interact because that's the key. We can't, we can't hide from each other. And so I always say to Ginny, I'll never live long enough to bring enough people into prison. But I'm going to do my darndest to bring as many people as I can come get into prison consistently to understand that we're in this together. We're in it together. And we can lift each other up. The community is getting just as much as the residents in the prison, by the way. And people in our program will not give up their spot. It's very difficult. <laughs> we have to say there are other people who would really like to like engage. So our goal is to be in every prison. And then, just by the way, catch me in the hallway and I'll tell you how I want to take a two square block area and build homes and apartments and flats and you know, put the butcher there and the baker and the shoe repair guy and the computer tech store using the community and a building corporation and everybody working together to build something where nobody wants to be. We can do all this, we can. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. I think that's the added value we're looking for. Um, Third principle, Johan, mm -hmm. you know that we've given you differentiation because that's the most tricky one. That's it's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> From now on it is. So. Um, differentiation, we understand this uh, in the sense that the many small houses should differ from each other um, so that they can offer individualized support. So they differ in terms of security measures, work, education, counseling. Um, but that's often quite abstract. So I'm wondering, can you make this a bit more concrete for us? And maybe if, if you want to apply it to the Norwegian context. Thank you. I'll do my best. And I was also told to speak slowly. <laughs> During my years uh, behind prison walls, I used to spend a lot of time thinking of how to improve our penal system because I had nothing else to do. <laughs> to complain and comment all my strange ideas. I noticed that what we inmates have in common was that we were serving a sentence, nothing else. We had nothing in common. We don't have the same hobbies, education, life experience, or age. What we had in common was that we stayed in the same institution and had committed a crime. And we also had uh, that we also were caught by the police, not the most clever criminals. So why do we incarcerate people? Do we believe in punishment or is the prison to keep the dangerous inmates away from society? Does this make the safe, uh, society feel safer or more satisfied that knowing and believing that punishment results in change? I don't believe in punishment. I know that I personally, I needed the break and it worked for me, but I don't believe in the system. The prison served the purpose for me. I had no worries, food was served. I met other inmates with whom I could plan my next criminal activities. It's what I feel is network building. Hopefully we could change some experience to avoid being caught by the police again. Some talk about rehabilitation, others about habilitation. I like those talks as a society we need to change from looking at incarcerated people as worse than the rest of us. Some are just less fortunate, others might have a criminal mindset. Who knows, is it okay to think that we need prisons to keep people locked in as a warehouse? Is this the revenge of the society or can we change prison to small school detention houses and look at them as a golden opportunity to go those who we want to incarcerate a fair chance to change? We scale advocates for different detention houses which uh, with the differentiation, we can focus on the needs and requirements of each and every inmate. Living together in closed circumstances and not having the choice to choose whom you want to socialize with is quite demanding. Particularly when statistics show that we inmates have less social contact, family, 
and network already. In modes have even less communication skills. We do have mental issues. I talk about myself, so I can <laughs> I don't worry. Um, the difference in our society has the opportunity to habilitate our inmates. Some of us have the drug problems, need education, and others of us have the mental problems. In Norway, we try to mix elder inmates with the younger ones. The idea behind that was an elder inmate could be the father or the person to the younger one, to be a support person, to be someone the younger could relate to. Is that differentiation? We could possibly create a closer relationship too. But from my experience, inmates are used to broken relationships. It's hard to connect to another person. From childhood, we have learned not to trust a relation. That can be from the parents or friends, and not to forget from their own criminal network. From the start, it worked very well to mix stages. However, the older has the ex same experience as the younger one, not trusting people, not used to be the perfect father used to prioritize themselves. The result was that the correctional service created separate units with seniors. The inmates served their sentence in a calmer environment. Their hobbies and interests of, or conversation was not necessarily similar. However, they had least age in common. And I also f believe that, that when you get, grow older, you have more hobbies and topics to discuss which are in common. It worked better for the prison guards as well. The department got their own identity and the prison guards got better work conditions. From differentiation, I believe in what we say call a differentiated um, detention units. I can also call them specialized. We know from Norway that we have drug rehabilitation units. That works very well. Where a lot of us more than 50% has drug problems. And this is, an, again, a golden opportunity to have small-scale detention units where we can habilitate people and have professional competence, psychologists, psychiatrists, to, to overcome the problems. That's something that the prison guards can't do. Uh, we need also qualified health personnel. We need qualified health personnel in the same unit, and we need to give them better work conditions. And when we have differentiated units, we can give better work conditions for the health personnel, the qualified personnel, the professional competence, which is important. With differentiated units, uh, we can connect with the industry. Um, not only the community, but the industry is also a part of uh, the community. And I believe that we ask for what skills are needed in the industry. We can educate people to meet those demands. Today, we educate people to be nothing. Uh, we, are, we just use it as uh, a free time activity. We need to meet the demands of the society to educate people in differentiated units. And I, I also believe that uh, taking more care of uh, the employees, of the detention houses, not only the inmates. I think it's important to create a, a good relationship, dynamic security, and, and if we di differentiate the units, we, the, the employees can also choose where they would like to work, and we as incarcerated people, we can ask and uh, apply for the units we would like to, uh, to be incarcerated in. Thank you, Johan. Um, I would like to... <laughs> I would like to come back to the last thing that you said. You said if there are differentiated or different detention houses, the, both the staff and the incarcerated people can choose um, where to go. Do you think this um, way of working can increase peop incarcerated people's agency in that they have a choice where to go or to choose? Absolutely, because when you're incarcerated, you, you don't have a choice where to go. And giving this opportunity uh, is a kind of motivation that I really want to go to drug unit or I want to be educated or I want to do something with my mental issues. I need help and this is my opportunity. And it, it gives me motivation for change. Uh, and I'm not changing for the outside of the society. I'm changing for my own needs. 
MJ, I, I hear you saying yes. You well, agree? I just, yes. I, I wanted to say, I, I say to the men and women in the room often, um, this is an opportunity. Make it an opportunity for yourself. Uh, uh, the, um, and, and I'll give you one example. Um, some of the young men, the lads from the estate in the hood, and, uh, and in, in our room we'll have you know every, a whole mix. So we have the white collar crime, the guys in the hood, and everything in between. And, and I'll say, I'll to say that some of the guys, I'll say, have you noticed that the white collar crime guys get out like from this horrible place that we're at into a nicer place within three to six months? And they say, see you later, and they're gone. And you're still here. You're hanging out with the boys in the hood. You're still here. What do they know that you don't know? And how come you haven't asked them? And isn't an issue that you don't know how to fill out the form, or you don't know who to ask, or you don't know how to be persistent? And, and so I'm really big on integrating the residents to know each other and to help each other to get out of a situation that's really horrible. Uh, Wandsworth Prison will be my example. Shh, don't tell anybody. And get to a nicer place. And, and, and that's why everybody needs to know each other, okay? And um, because you have to take this as an opportunity, and you're right, education, whatever it may be, what, what is your dream? What is your passion? Where do you, what, do you, what do you think you're good at? This is your moment. Strip everything away. This is your moment. What are the issues that you need to address now? And, and, and that's why the community has to come in, why the community has to be involved on the inside and the outside, because if they know what's going on, they can change it, because we have, we have that. We can all, I mean, I was thrilled to hear that people can vote. What, what, what country was that? And yes, fantastic, okay. Uh, that's the only way we change it. Everybody needs to know. And so I always joke with the volunteers, um, when they go home and they have a dinner party, they get to talk to their friends about it. And they'll, they'll come in and tell stories. The more people that come in on a regular basis, whatever charity you are, invite as many people as you can inside so that they understand and that they get to know the men and women there and the staff, as you said. By the way, if you pay nothing, you know the expression, odds are you get nothing. You need to pay and appreciate people that are caring for other people. I'll stop. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I, I was also wondering uh, if you have questions for each other. Don't feel free to ask them. But uh, MJ, I was also wondering, because you have your choir, you know how to work with community, you know how to build community. But if we're going to work with detention houses and no longer prisons, can you see yourself working in detention houses or do you need a big choir to have this community feeling? No, you can sing anywhere in any kind of room. It's groovy. You can interact with people anywhere. I mean, that's, you know, I often think about that. If somebody came on my street and said they wanted to build a detention house, what would be my reaction? And I think my first impulse would be, oh, no. Okay? Especially if I don't know the group, I don't know the people. And then second would be, oh, my God, my neighbors. Because I do know my neighbors. Okay? And, 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 but I know in my heart the right thing to do. And, and so then I would be coming up with the plan how everybody would get to know each other. It would be on my list of activities. We're all going to talk. We're going to know each other's first names, their background, their issues. We'll all reveal ourselves. You know, I struggled with this. Did you struggle with that? Oh, you did. Me too. How about you? Okay. <laughs> and then it might take a couple months, but we'd work it out. Okay, and I think that's really key, isn't it? Uh, you, you know, you just can't walk up and say, oh, by the way, just so you know, we're building a unit with 20 people who are going to be in it that have been in prison, by the way. Oh, don't be, don't be worried, and don't hide your kids away. You know, so there has to be a, a conscious plan. There's no question about it. There, there, that's where I'm coming from. There, sorry. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Yulam, and maybe also Savrina. We know that um, since, as criminologists, we look at best practices, we usually look at prisons that already exist that are small scale, that are somehow community integrated. Um, maybe, Yulam, can you think of Norwegian prisons that you would consider as a detention house? And well, some of them have uh, have some of it uh, in them. Uh, some of them are not small scale, but they are community integrated, and, and some of them are differentiated, uh, and some of them are inside huge prisons. For example, our drug uh, rehabilitation units, they are often inside high security prisons. They are hard to run because a part of uh, the rehabilitation is to be out in the community. Uh, and when you're in a high security prison, they don't like that because there is a high risk of uh, importing drugs again because that we are very good at. <laughs> um, but uh, we have uh, high risk, uh, high security prison with uh, a, a greenhouse next to it. And the neighbors, they love it. And I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful example of one of the most famous criminals in Norway. Uh, they, they work there, and, and the grandmothers, and even my mother, she loves them, and she doesn't like criminals, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I think that's a beautiful part of, of how you can see integration in society, because uh, they, they communicate, and they get the best possible service you can get, uh, and everything is correct, and they carry every flower to the car. So, so yes, we do have some examples. Sabrina, do you? Are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, that's a tricky question, because I never work with best practices, so it's, and it's very hard to talk about best practices with prisons, no? for the reasons that we touched earlier. Um, I think that if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick uh, Skybo in Denmark, because it's the only case that at least I know where uh, in prison people live with people that are not in prison and that are not staff. So it's this sort of relationship between, you know, sentenced people and non-sentenced people that I kind of appreciate the most. Do you, do you also think that, that uh, architecture plays a role there? Do you think this, this example that you mentioned in Denmark, does it have specific architectural uh, yeah. features that make it more like a detention house? I, I think it does features that make more, it more like a place where people can live and inhabit a place and appropriate a place in the sense that it's not home. I mean, it was not designed as homely. It's made in bricks and concrete. Uh, it's mild brutalism, that's what we, this is a brutalist building, so just to give you an idea, and that follows this line. Um, the rooms are uh, along a corridor, so they're like, uh, someone can read them as cells, but they're not, they're square, so people inside can move their beds in whatever edge of the room they want, which is impossible in a normal prison. And there are some features that allow people to inhabit the space and to make it homely if they want, but it's not designed, you know, with cute tiles coming from a work kitchen or our imagination of a home, just to give you an idea. I mean... It, that's the, again the agency that you are Yes, already. that's the agency, because I think that people in prison, they have their own values, maybe their values change over time, and the feeling at home, like as if they were a good housewife, maybe it's not one of their values, or maybe it is, and they have to decide what, they, they need to be able to decide what they want, even in the aesthetic and in the kind of furniture, furniture that they use. So I, I like the, the, the word you use, homely, uh, and I have an example from a prison governor in Norway that those are from transition houses now, uh, and we were not to allowed to call a prison guard. It was, you know, uh, hello by the first name, and uh, we were not living in cells, we were living in rooms, and we were inhabitors. <coughs> and he's now the director of two transition houses, and uh, he has now taken away the reception desk, because you don't have a reception at home. 
And he says, this is your home. So we, he's taken down the reception. So you enter the, the hall and you are then in the living room. And I think his philosophy uh, is, uh, you know, changing the words, changing the language and, and really socializing. And, and there you're out working at a normal workplace from eight to four every day. You return and you cook dinner together, talking about group of people. Uh, we are, there are 15, 16 inmates, but there are like automatically a group of four, two, three, or four who cook dinner yeah. together. Yeah. And so you can't cook with 15 people. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you work like a chef. So that's different. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I just want to say something else too about community. Um, uh, uh, there are more people in this world that want to make a difference than those that just want to not do anything or sit on the fence. You have to give them the opportunity. And uh, so that's that to me, that's really important to know that you have to give people opportunities and open the door and and uh, and show them the way. And then the second thing is um, I'm a believer in reasonable, tough love. Everybody needs to know the rules, the community and the residents outside, if you're developing anything, and inside. And, um, and that has to be open to everybody. And, and so that you're, um, you know, so I'm very um, clear in my sessions, and I'm clear with my men and women when they come out, and the volunteers of what I expect, the responsibilities, and then to revisit it and be okay about it. Because that's where we're at. It's just the way it is. Deal with it. And as we move further and further away, and trust develops for uh, trust for the residents and past uh, ex-offenders, okay, with the community, we 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 become freer and freer, and and vice versa for the community, and 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 that's dialogue, and that should be continuous. It's not one time because guess what? We forget, we forget, or or we think it might be okay, this or that. And so you revisit. You revisit just as a reminder. And that's cool too, because we're only human beings. We're not you know, geniuses, okay? And um, uh, so reasonable, tough love, I think, is a, a groovy thing. <laughs> Softens the blow. <laughs> and that will be much easier if we have many detention houses. So you, have, you all have one in your neighborhood that you can easily visit. Is there anything else that you want to add that has not been discussed and you would really like to mention here? <clears throat> I think when we talk about detention houses, uh, we need to talk about high security, low security, transition houses, uh, small detention units are needed in, on all security levels. And I believe in trust, uh, not in high security measures. I need. Uh, I agree. Tough uh, in love, but, but uh, we we need uh, to give people trust, and that's the only way we can show that we want to do change and want to change ourselves. Uh, and that's the way we should move forward. And it's easier to build small detention units. Uh, it's easier to get the permission, uh, and it's easier to integrate with the neighbors. Uh, and I also know that we were going to move one. Um, unit in Norway uh, from one neighborhood to another. And uh, the new neighborhood, they said, not in my backyard. Uh, and and uh, the other uh, unit where they had a transition house, uh, they wrote a letter together and said there is less crime in our neighborhood than any other neighborhood because you don't shit in your own place. just add to this thing of the trust because when we talk because we met before today uh, there was something that Johan told me about the idea of trust and the fact that you know you need to go small from the perspective of uh, the people inhabiting it because it's a low trust environment and if you want to trust people you need to know them and I started to think what does it mean in architecture and and trust in, us in architecture doesn't correspond to the way in which we, we have designed prisons in the sense that doesn't respond to full visibility and full transparency. Trust needs thresholds, not only metaphorically, also in space. And so that's maybe just my conclusion from an architecture point that if you are going to design detention houses, 
that, by the way, even, I mean, even for people that, like me, are more on the abolished uh, side, are probably the most reasonable thing to do in the prison system. If you are going to do that, you need to take the risk that it will not all be full transparent and full open, but there will be blind spots. And uh, so I think it's, we shouldn't evaluate them whether there is an aggression or not. You know, it's, it will happen, it can happen. And architecture shouldn't control it too much. Thank you very much. And thank you all very much. <laughs>